Okay, so um, today's, today's discussion uh, deals with uh, programming with categories, lecture two. Um, uh, within that lecture, uh, we saw some introdu introduction of further sort of basic uh, concepts uh, from category theory. So some basic definitions of a category theory and an attempt to articulate kind of a, a categorical perspective um, uh, on things, um, uh, kind of a, a categorical way of looking at the world uh, that appropriately enough um, is based on relationships and based on uh, a notion of uh, the roles that things play within, uh, within a certain structure as, um, as really the uh, point of, of focus and where we have a composition where we have the ability to, to um, compose one thing with another uh, systematically and in a way that preserves structure in a way that, um, that maintains the, uh, the structural integrity of the, the things being, being linked up. Um, within this context, we saw the notion of shapes as probes. And, and there's this uh, somewhat of necessity, given where it is in the course, uh, somewhat hand wavy uh, notion of, um, you know, we can kind of have a notion of an observer um, and with a shape like uh, an arrow or, uh, you know, two objects um, uh, or a, uh, Two objects which have one a morphism from each to the other. Um, uh, we can think of the, about that shape as somehow um, representing or finding or serving as a probe into a um, into another structure. And there's this notion of kind of generalized elements that that came from um, that was related to this where. Uh, Brendan Fong, um, who is presenting, commented, for example, if we have a, a set, a set A, and then we have another set of size one, um, you could see, you could think of um, the elements, well, you could name each of the elements of A, a more categorical perspective is one that focuses on the relationships. It focuses on the the links. It, it doesn't require us to go into A and talk about each element of it. Rather, it, it talks about the relationship between another set, this one element set, um, and, and the set A. Um, and the observation was that um, if you talk about all functions from a one element set to the set A, those are in one-to-one -one correspondence with that is, they're isomorphic to. There's the same number of them uh, as, and we could think of them as kind of labeling um, or being labeled by the corresponding elements of A to which they go. So there's going to be one function that goes from, you know, the uh, the only possible input to the first element of A, and there's going to be another function that goes to the second element of A, and the third element of A, and the fourth element of A. And of course, we're talking about these elements right now. But once we think about these functions, we'll just realize, well, there's a set of those functions. And the set of those functions can be thought of as the elements of A. It's kind of uh, and the elements of A in another way. And it doesn't require us to look inside the set A. It's just. Um, it, it, the very existence of those elements tells us about, about A, tells us everything we need to know about, about A. Um, there was further an introduction of uh, pre-orders and monoidal categories, which we kind of uh, um, examined ahead of time uh, within our last discussion. And uh, very quickly, Brendan talked about duality, this notion that, um, uh, we we could think about a category and it has morphisms in it and it has objects in it. Um, and that's useful, but sometimes it's useful to talk about, if we call that category C, we talk about C off, the kind of same, you, you think about viewing that category um, 
in in a way that all the arrows are flipped flipped and um it's the same objects uh it's same morphisms it's just that they are viewed as going instead of from a to b for example going from b to a um and uh, we we treat that kind of opposite of the category c op um uh as a as a point of real uh, real interest when it comes to many areas of category theory um and you may be puzzled like why you would want to view it like that well it turns out it's really really useful in certain domains uh an example is when you're dealing with profunctors um which take one thing from uh c op and another thing from a category d uh and and then can link up uh link up things accordingly it turns out reason that the opposite of a category is super useful as well in certain contexts when we want to think about some of these structures we'll be looking at like products or co-products um those would correspond to kind of tuples in haskell versus um either uh type constructs where you have this thing or that thing or that thing and it turns out that those can just be related as as uh, opposites of one another same objects just the arrows are pointed in the in the wrong in the opposite way and you'll see duality come in in a lot of different places uh in some quite useful useful ways and um as we'll see we'll spend time talking about functors but there'll be um covariant functors and contravariant functors um functors which are covariant um will will be dealing in terms of a category uh, c to to d um and then there's contravariant functors which will be dealing with c c op um with the C, but with the the opposite uh, uh, the opposite uh, direction of arrows. So um, uh, so duality turns out to be quite important. Um, we also saw it from the categorical perspective that just as we prefer to not um, think about the internals of every object, we have these objects and we. We don't like to kind of break down the abstraction about what's inside each one. We deal with the relationships, the role it plays as denoted by its the arrows into and out of it. So it is with um, uh, a, pers a broader perspective as well on whether two, two things are equal. Um, rather than asking, are they, if you peer inside them, are they really the same thing? We ask, do they play the same role in the category? In other words, um, are they, if you view them from the outside, um, if you view how things are linked up to them or how they link up to other things, is it the same for the two objects? If so, we, we say that they're, uh, they're sort of, uh equivalent um or they're the the same they're essentially the same even if they're not strictly equal they're interchangeable um they there's an isomorphism between them which means that one is just kind of a re relabeling or renaming of the other there's nothing inherently different between them in terms of the roles they play so within categories we um we we talk about uh this notion of sameness or equivalence uh in a way that's looser than equality you'll still see equalities come up uh particularly when it comes to things like home sets and so on but uh because they're members of set but a lot of attention will be paid to um whether things are isomorphic um, you also saw an introduction in, in this lecture of the lambda calculus. Um, and uh, this wasn't, uh, I think, uh, so completely specified out, but Brendan Fong introduced this construct of the lambda calculus, uh, whereby you could characterize functions um, 
uh, and apply functions in expressions in these, these kind of formulas um, uh, in a way that uh, was quite flexible. Um, but it didn't have too much structure to it in the sense that you could pass any function to any other function. Everything is a function. Everything can be applied. Everything can have things applied to it or be applied or be passed in to as as part of another application. And it was kind of uh, um, magmatic. It was kind of loose. Um, uh, by contrast, um, uh, and that that was he termed it. He gave the analogy to kind of a a system without types. There was no typing. Anything could be applied to anything else, and um, there was nothing to say. You know that, as he put it, you know the string elephant couldn't be applied to a to a to to the string uh, mammoth or something like that. Um, uh, so uh, the way he was headed with that is it turns out that categories actually um, allow us to characterize uh, types, um, a typed, um, a typing mechanism, typed computation, because we have, we have objects and there's uh, morphisms between objects and these morphisms, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, family intrusion here uh, in my teaching, but um, uh, we have morphisms between objects and really for one morphism to be composed with another, they have to line up end to end. So if we have a, a morphism from A to B and another morphism from B to C, um, then we can compose them. We can have, uh, so if we have F and then G, we can do F and then G uh, or G after F. Uh, but if they don't line up, um, we can't do that. And, and you could think of this kind of lining up and this kind of ability to be put end to end, um, meaning they, they, they line up in terms of the objects is, as associated with types. Um, not everything can be applied to everything else. You can't compose any two morphisms. They have to be, one has to output things that the other can input that it can legitimately input. It can, it take this one, this morphism goes from A to B. It kind of, you could think of it as kind of, if, if you think of it as a function, it can output a B. And the next one takes in a B, it inputs a B and it turns it into a C. And those are things you can line up um, in contrast to lambda calculus where anything can be applied to anything else. Here, we, we have this kind of input output that's associated with typing. And so categories add this extra structure atop of lambda calculus that is associated with types. And Brendan, you know, spoke um, very briefly about this balance between flexibility um, uh, and on the one hand and structure and sort of capturing uh, germane um, abstractions and um, and sort of the essential features of a given situation within our uh, within our context, as we do with with categories. And so much of category theory and the categorical perspective is about structure as captured by relationships and its preservation as we map one thing to the other. Um, we don't just have any old mapping. Uh, we have mappings that preserve the essential structure of what they're working with. For example, a homomorphism between one ring and another. It doesn't just willy-nilly translate the elements of the first ring to the other. It maps identity to identity. It maps composition to composition. It's kind of a well-behaved mapping that honors that structure that's already there. Uh, and so it is throughout category theory. We seek things that honor the structure of the systems we're working with. So um, those were some themes that came out of that programming with categories uh, lecture two. Uh, and those themes will 
will be present through a lot of the, the course. And as last time, uh, I have you know, a set of slides that I could show Jermaine to this, but I wanted to prioritize questions for discussion, confusions, things that I could help uh, explicate or that we together could discuss and put our heads together as to how to think about them. So uh, anyone want to uh, put forward some things that they found interesting or they found confusing or um, you know that they'd, they'd like to hear uh, more about um, to make best use of this hour? Um, I found, um, I liked when he went over the ideas of like when he was thinking of categories. So the whole like, he had kind of three groups. He had the shapes, the pre-orders, and then the monoids. Um, the pre-orders and the monoids, uh, because I we had kind of gone over some of those already. So it was a review. So they made a lot of sense. But the initial one of shapes, I got hung up yeah. on some of the concepts there. So I don't know if we could review like shapes as a category. I know that was probably first is the most basic, but yeah. I had issues mostly mm -hmm. with um, the, like the arrow, the arrows that he put in or the, like the yeah. morphisms yeah. that he had for the shape. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so this is a very good question. And you've, you've gotten, you zeroed in on, on what I think is uh, without um, it, it, attention that Brendan was trying to walk when he, uh, Brendan Fong, when he was presenting that, because as with all these things, um, um, some of the best examples are from further on in the course. Um, and, and yet mentioning those examples requires importing a set of concepts that are um that are, are not yet present in people and so they um you know there's this balance of like how much does you want to give a sneak preview of something and risk confusing people because they they say like what the heck is a natural transformation or that adjunction stuff was weird um uh, it, uh you know what was that um he doesn't want to freak people out with, with showing them something that's too bizarre um, or too outside their mental scope. But at the same time, um, like before we're at that level, some of this doesn't quite um, gel. It, it doesn't, the, the examples are kind of thin until you get to some of these later areas. And in my view, the, the primary um, place that that, that that notion of shapes as objects or generalized uh, elements or shapes, um, uh, you know, as helping to kind of serve as patterns. Um, the, the place that that really comes out beautifully uh, is um, in the area first, is the area of functors. It turns out it comes out after that. And there's some beautiful stuff with dynamical systems. It turns out that hopefully we'll see together where this is really true. Um, and so you have shapes that kind of represent a steady state or a shape that represents the, the behavior of a system over time or a shape that represents cyclic behavior or what have you. But really where it first blossoms is not, not far from here. Uh, it's, it's the area of functors. And this group, um, this is a august group that we're with right now, Fortunately, has seen elements of this. And um, so hopefully you'll be less freaked out than some of the other people in the room would have been if Brendan had rolled that out and trotted that out um, in the context of uh, that lecture. So what I'm gonna do, and and you know, I, I ran out of time because I was meeting with a student just before this, but I'm gonna need to, to plug in my tablet and um, and just get this hitched up so I can sketch something. But I think you'll you'll find it rewarding if I actually show you um, some basic uh, some basic use of this uh, in the functor context. You'll immediately get this concept much better. So uh, can you give me about um, give me about a minute 
I'm, I'm just going to get something hitched up, turn the tablet on, and frob some audiovisual connections. So um, give me just a moment, and uh, I'll be back. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, through a, a miracle of AV um, coordination, I was able to uh, pull off the connection of my uh, my tablet here. Um, and can you folks see a uh, a canvas uh, right now? Yes. Okay. Um, that's great. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, go and uh, draw some categories on this uh, to illustrate this concept. So what Brendan had talked about um, was a very, very simple notion up front. So he had uh, he had a, a uh, uh, sort of a set uh, X, right? Um, and he had successive elements of it. Maybe I'll, I'll use this. Um, uh, and each of these elements was an element of X. And what he had said, this notion of shapes as probes, is, is that if you had another set like this, um, that rather than going in and kind of peering into the set X here, um, uh, we could, uh, and, and talk about each element in it, we can instead um, keep our attention at the level of relationships um, between things. So specifically, we could talk instead about um, functions uh, between these. So there'd be one function from this to this. That's, that's one possible function. It takes in the only thing that can be possibly taken in and maps it to X. Uh, the other, another function, an alternative function would map it here. An alternative function would map it here. Um, this one would map it here, that one would map it there. And lo and behold, these uh, here, uh, these functions collectively are uh, equinumerate. They're the same count of them as uh, these elements of X. And so, you know, he, he viewed these as kind of the generalized elements uh, of of these uh, of X, he termed, you know, these components as kind of essentially representing what's inside of X. Um, they each represent an element of X, and this notion of representation goes really deep in category theory. Um, we'll we'll talk about representative functors, uh, not so many lectures from now, um, but these these kind of represent those functions and. Often we treat them as kind of interchangeably with these elements when we're dealing with set. Now, this is very specifically about set. This is very specific to set. This is one of the things that makes set so unique as a category um, when we're dealing with objects being sets and uh, morphisms being functions between them. It has this very nice property, but to, to address Jenna's question, so this is sort of um, with uh, set. Um, uh, so set um, uh, isomorphism of uh, well, um, uh, of functions to elements. Um, there we go. Uh, let's let's create a new one though, because to, to address Jenna's question, um, uh, he started to talk about shapes, right? We have these shapes. Um, uh, wait, wait, you, you raised your hand. Did you want to ask a question about this guy first before I go on to the general case? Yeah, the, hopefully this will be quick to answer. Uh, sure. Basically, what is how is set defined? Because I didn't catch that from, from yeah. the video. Good. Um, so uh, within set, so this is this category set, and it's actually, it, the, the convention is to kind of, Embolden it, it. Uh, so I maybe I should have like drawn it like this. Set. Uh, it's nice and bold. When we write category names, we put them in bold. Um, and boldface. Uh, so set has objects um, being sets. So so within the category set, um, and we. Uh, you know, if for 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 ease, we might talk about uh, uh, the category of finite sets. Um, it's a bit easier to think about, but objects are sets, and um, and the morphisms 
between any two objects. So if you had an object A and an object B, the morphisms are the uh, functions between those two sets. So within set, this is an object here. So this would be, you know, object, um, object uh, one, and this would be another object two. And these would be the morphisms here um, between them. Uh, so in this case, the HOM set, may, maybe I'll call this um, A uh, with, a, with a, a nod towards um, some of our later use of, of representables. And maybe I'll call this set X. Um, I, I put the label up top before, but I'll, I'll just put it down here for consistency. So the HOM set in set set um, is the name of the category. A comma X, um, or if you prefer, HOM uh, of set in set of A comma X uh, consists of exactly the set of all of these morphisms. These are all morphisms. They happen to be functions because we're in set and each function maps everything in the source set Right, each a function to do its job, it's a standard definition of function to do its job, to be an honest to goodness function, it has to map everything in the source set, um, in, the, in the domain to everything, uh, to, to, to a corresponding selected one in the codomain. Um, so, so each element uh, in the source set has to be mapped to a specific element in the codomain, the thing it maps to, the, the range of it. Um, the, and, and collectively, the set of all functions from one set to another set um, is, is the HOM set. It's the, the morphisms between A here and X. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's clear to me, thank you. Okay, okay. Any, any other question? about that, we'll be viewing set a lot. Um, set will be one of our favorite categories. Um, it's a category we understand everything about, we can enumerate. In fact, you did. For your exercise last time, you enumerated all the functions between you know, various sets. And those are all in set. Those are all HOM sets you enumerated, um, the, the possible functions between them. And it's a very nice category, but it has very little structure to it. There's actually like, like the, the internals of a of a set are kind of this jumble bunch of stuff. There's not there's not much structure. We'll later be dealing with categories where the objects have a lot more structure, and uh, where the mappings between them preserve that structure. And that will get really interesting. Like instead of being sets, those would be monoids, and the morphisms between them would be mon monoid homomorphisms. Not any old mapping, but but ones that preserve the structure. And there'll be lots and lots of cases like that. There'll be functors and between them will be natural transformations, the things that preserve the features of those functors as we map between them. They preserve it in a nice way. Or the objects will be categories and we'll have functors going between them that preserve the structure of the category. Any questions further about this before I jump in for the Jenna answer? To, to take this to another level. Cause, cause you may have wondered recently. So like Brendan then started like drawing things like this, right? Or we have an arrow between two points. And it's like, well, uh, like how do we kind of map that to X? How does that serve as a probe for X? And that's a reasonable question. So we're gonna go explore that because that's when functors come in. Hmm. Any, any questions before I switch to do that? No questions. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to that. Um, okay, so this is a sneak preview, but it's a preview down a road you've you've been on before and traveled before. So hopefully it won't freak you out too much. So um, we have uh, categories, um, uh, and each category has a set of objects and then has a set of morphisms between objects. And 
you know, those morphisms are not all just the same. Each object has a guaranteed identity morphism. And there's structure there because morphisms can be composed if they line up end to end. We can compose them and, and any two morphisms that line up end to end has to have a composite of those, those two morphisms, you know, F and then G, which is itself in the category. And if you compose on either end with an identity um, morphism, you have to get, you know, if you compose it with another morphism, you have to get other, that other morphism back. And it has to be associative um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a nice way. Um, uh, okay, so um, we have one category and we have another category. Um, to make this colorful, maybe I'll, I'll make this the red category. Maybe I'm, um, yeah, there we go. This is uh, uh, the East is red, Dong Fang Hong. Um, okay, so uh, here's here's uh, one category and here's another category. And um, when we're dealing with this, um, now we can start to talk about this mapping of shapes in ways that we couldn't uh, earlier. Like when we were in set, we didn't have a way of kind of saying, oh, there's a shape and it maps to, um, so this is a mapping of shapes uh, between categories with functors. We couldn't really represent like, oh, there's a, um, I should make it that color. Let's, let's choose, a, well, back in black. Uh, and here we go, boom, um, there we go. And um, maybe, maybe we'll start with just a, a dot here. And then we have a bunch of dots over uh, in this one here that are of color red. Um, there we go. Uh, okay. Um, so here's here's a probe. Okay. And um, Brenda was talking about mapping of probes to sort of find things or to identify things or serve as patterns to match things elsewhere. How would that work? Well. A functor's job in life is going to be a structure preserving mapping between categories. Uh, so maybe this is over here on the left, category C, and maybe over here on the right, we have category D. Um, okay. And a, a, a functor will map all objects to objects. So maybe it'll map. Um, this is one possible functor, right? Um, that's just one of many. There's actually another functor, which will map it to this one, right? Um, that'll be another possible functor. And I could draw many such. Um, so it has to map objects to objects. And you may remember, and we'll get to it, it has to map morphisms to morphisms too, but not just to any old morphism, but to a morphism connected to the object. But let's start with the object. So here, if we, if we take this object in C, we map it to an object in D. Okay, well, that's very nice. Um, we have this kind of mapping, but if we think about all such functors, um, this is one functor in blue. I'm gonna draw another functor in navy blue. There we go. Um, I'm gonna draw yet another possible functor over here in, in gray, okay? Um, and, uh, and another one in magenta. These are all alternative functors. They're not all occurring at once, but they're alternative functors. And you'll notice that each of them kind of finds an instance of that dot over here in D, right? And if, and if we think about like the full set of them. I won't draw it out, but if we think about the full set, this kind of finds, if we think about the full set of those functors, it, it finds all the dots over in D. And you could say, well, yeah, so I, I guess that's true. It's very nice, but um, isn't that basically what we did, you know, here? Um, we, we just kind of found all the elements over here. And the answer is, yeah, it's, it's actually uh, pretty much uh, uh, a similar thing here. But um, now let's go look at something more interesting than that. So what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to uh, 
go and I'm going to look at a more interesting shape. This will be like uh, the the walking uh, the walking arrow. Um, okay, and uh, I was hoping, but I am uh, disappointed by uh, the uh, silicon truculence that I'm not going to be able to to directly sort of. Um, uh take these out but i'll i'll take them out one by one in a kind of manual way okay there we go uh and they've let you know left some detritus okay um so let's let's um think about suppose we had now um hey get back there um uh, oh no not magenta um okay um okay Ooh, here's here's our what what Brendan called the walking arrow. Okay, this is a walking arrow in the sense that it's you talk about someone being a walking encyclopedia, or they're you know uh, uh, a, a walking compiler or something like that. Like they they have this you know incredible. Uh, they're the essence of of um, whatever you're attributing to them. Um, uh, they're a walking scholar. Um, this is a walking um, uh, a walking arrow here. Um, it represents arrowhood. And now let's draw some more structure in D because we're going to be finding um, arrows over here in D. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, Christine's uh, message to me is um, is, is blocking it, so I'm going to have to close that. Okay. So we're going to draw some arrows over here. We'll get, we get we need to find some arrows. So we're going to put some arrows in. Um, otherwise, we'll be we'll be uh, coming up short. So here's an arrow, boom, and maybe um, here's another arrow. And obviously, I could flesh that out. Apologies for the crudeness of my arrow. My drafting instructor will be disappointed. Um, okay. So um, uh, if I want to find all arrows, well. Uh, the idea is to use a functor again. So what, what's this functor going to do? Well, functor is going to, this, this light blue functor is going to map this guy, say, to this guy. Okay. Um, and this gal is going to be mapped to this gal. Okay. There she goes. Okay. Boom. Um, and uh, that's functors is mapping objects. But remember, functors map morphisms. In fact, so much of our attention the real interesting thing with functors are they're going to map morphisms to morphisms. So to what morphism will this map? Well, we don't have any choice. If this maps to this guy and this maps to this guy, this morphism has to map to this one. In fact, there's no functor, and this is getting to the heart of the matter. There's no functor, for example, that is going to map this one to this one and this one to this one, because there's no arrows between them. It, 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 it's got to do something with this um, with his arrows. It can collapse things. It can map them into the same one other things are being mapped to, but it can't just delete it. It can't ignore it. So this uh, this dot can only be mapped to things which have an arrow out of them, um, and this dot can only be mapped to things which have an arrow into them. Um, so so this functor can map. Uh, this this one to this one, this one to this one, and, and this arrow to that arrow. And that will be a functor. And hey, look, it found an arrow. It found an arrow in D. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, but you know, that's not our only functor, right? Uh, alternatively, we could map this one to, well, you tell me. I mean, can that one, tell me, can this one go to this one? Will it be a happy camper if it goes to that one? What do you think? Is the functor map to there? Let's suppose we try it, okay? And let's suppose we said, okay, this one's gonna go to this one. Okay, now we need to map this arrow. And what are we gonna map it to? Well, we, we're tempted to map it to here, but this arrow goes in the wrong direction. It, this arrow needs to go, you know, uh, here from this guy to this guy. And there's no way we could map it to this arrow because there's no arrow from them. So it actually can't, can't 
go this way. There's no legitimate functor that does this. And there's no functor that maps the arrow to this arrow because it's in the wrong direction. Um, the definition of a functor will require that, you know, if you have A mapped to something over here, um, so we have A to map to F of A, B mapped to F of B, um, then any arrow from A to B over here needs to map to one from F of A to F of B. And that's not possible here. So there's actually no functor of the sort, the dark blue here. But where is there a functor? Can anyone tell me? Where, where can I find another functor? Hmm? Where's there another functor hiding here? Go blue. Where's there another functor? Well, okay, yeah. Um, I was hoping that was one of you giving the answer. Um, there we are. Boom. So that one could go to that one. This one could go to, I think I'll choose non planarity over. Um, oh man, okay, that hurts. Um, not the first time you would have noticed. Uh, okay, there, boom. There we go. Um, and uh, sorry for the cross, but this one can map to this one. Um, that is a legitimate functor. It maps objects to objects. So this object is mapped to, let's trace the arrow. This object is mapped to this one, the source. This one is mapped to that one, the target. And this arrow is maps up from the map of the source to the map of the target. So those are two morphisms, or these are sorry, two functors, a functor between C and D. Now a functor needs to do more than this. It needs to preserve, uh, needs to preserve identity um, morphisms. Like there's, there's an identity morphism over here. It needs to, to turn that into identity morphism over there. It needs to preserve composition. But these are using the most basic feature of functors. We have found each functor um, finds uh, an instance of the pattern uh, of the arrow pattern, which is pretty cool. Um, so, you know, we can. We can find that. Uh, Shaoyan, you had a question? Um, yeah. So um, I'm kind of confused. So to, it's, it's like, so the functor is find the pattern in D. So I'm not sure it's the exact pa pattern or it's kind of the minimum pattern or something. So for example, um, if, if, if in D, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, if between two objects, if there are two morphisms. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah. between that, so yeah. Right, so it's a great question. So suppose that over here in D, we had like a morphism like this. Yeah. Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so there, it's a great question. So there'd be one functor that goes, goes to, to, this, to this one. Um, and then there'd be another functor that, that um, that sort of um, and at the cost of of making this really ugly, maybe maybe, maybe dark green, forest green. Um, okay, uh, you know this would also go to there, uh, um, and um, uh, full horror is now realized. And this goes to there, and then. The arrow would go to, what's the principle of least harm here? Um, it would go like to this one. That would be another functor, right? Um, so it, it would find this pattern as it existed uh, here, and it would find this pattern as it existed here with, with this morphism. Um, what, what is true for all of these is that all the objects over here in D and C need to be mapped into an object in D. 
And all the morphisms over here in C need to be mapped to a morphism in D. I'm going to show you one that's that's not obvious though. Um, but maybe I'll maybe I'll uh, answer the the question that's uh, just um, uh, been raised. First, I should say Shayan, is that helpful? What I said? Um, yeah, 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 it's helpful. Thank okay. you. Okay, someone else has their hand up, and unfortunately, I can't can't tell who that is because of the vagaries of the window management right now. But um, uh, uh, um, Jenna, it's Jenna. Jenna, yeah. Yep. So, uh huh. I guess I had a question about um, like an identity yeah. situation in D. So, like yeah. an arrow yes. pointing back to itself. Does yeah. it find it the same sort of way then? It's just the tip of yeah. the arrow in C yeah. and the tail all go to the same. Place? Yeah, exa exactly what I was. That was my next little thing I was going to show you. Okay. Um, so so here remember that each of these things like if we looked at them under a microscope and with like you know um like lemon juice to turn the invisible ink um uh into a color what what we'd actually see is is something like um like this right we'd we'd see um uh we'd see these little self arrows um and it's not that every self like maybe some of these have honest to goodness like like non identity map picks maybe some of things like this um that you know just just are things that you know take in an int and return an int or something like that right maybe some of two um but all of them every single one regardless whether it has other ones has some of these dotted ones uh which are the identity ones those are very special ones because if you compose those with anything else, uh, you get that something else back. Um, uh, every object is guaranteed to have one of these. Um, we just don't normally draw them. Now, uh, let's consider how this would work, Jenna. Um, and you know, I probably shouldn't be try to try to be comprehensive about it, but um, it looks mighty pretty to me. Um, okay, so. Um, so so let's let's imagine that um uh so we're gonna we're gonna create we haven't used gray this time um uh okay so um we're gonna map this one over to this okay now i'm tempted to say what if we mapped it this one over to this one could we connect them? And the answer is no, because there, there's no way we can map this morphism between it. Or, you know, again, if if this guy here is mapped to this, if if this is A and this is a functor uh, on A and this is B, um, probably should have labeled those earlier. And this is F of B. Then this arrow has to go from F of A to F of B. There has to be an arrow, and there's not. So there's no functor that will like map in this sort of way, um, you know, over to here. And so uh, what there is though, and I think this is what Jenna was perceptively picking up. Okay, now I'm gonna, um, hey, hey, give me the, how, how can I delete, delete? Hey, no, no, don't delete him. Um, oh man, um, okay, now, now we gotta, um, Hey, select object. This is what I want. Boom. No. Oh man. Oh. Oh. Okay. That looks tempting. Oh no. It's the wrong one. Um. Okay. No. No. I'm in. I'm in. In doo doo. Okay. Um. Come on. This is like a large fraction of my life has been spent crafting category theory diagrams in here. Okay. It's it's elusive. So I'm just gonna have to do the 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 back. Um. Here we go. Come on. Get get back there. There we go. Okay. So what we could do instead is uh, um, let's get it. Make sure it's in that. Make sure it's in that. Uh, mumble. Um, this. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now we're cooking with gas. So this guy could go up to here, and you could say like, well, wait a minute. There's no arrow between. Oh, wait a minute. There's guaranteed to be an arrow. There's at least this identity arrow. And so what could this guy be mapped onto? What could this morphism be mapped into? 
she could be mapped right into that identity arrow, right like that, um, with that satisfying click. It could be mapped to that identity arrow. And you may say, well, that's kind of degenerate, right? It, it kind of collapsed it all down. And that's OK for functors. They can collapse things down. Um, they can cl collapse many objects into the same object. But the, they, you know, the, the structure has to be preserved. So this, this arrow still needs to go whatever it sent the endpoints to. It has to go between them. And, and that's just the identity arrow here. Um, so here we're mapping this morphism into the identity arrow here. And that's always OK. That's always OK. So remember, when we have this functor, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them probably this next lecture. But when we have functors, everything over in this category in C has to be handled by the functor and mapped into things here. But it could be mapped into some of the same things as long as it preserves that structure. Um, and uh, and and yet it doesn't it, it doesn't have to be the case that the functor has to map over to everything in D. It can map just in subpieces. And what we've seen here is it kind of finds this pattern. It kind of finds it over here in D, but sometimes finds it in a kind of in a way I'll use the mathematical term. It's degenerate. It's kind of um, a, a particularly simple version of it. It's like um, you know, a, a trivial version or a shrunk, shrunk version. Um, so, but this is kind of our pattern, right? Um, this is our pattern and we can find it via functors that map it into things. And you may say, well, that's a kind of trivial pattern. Uh, could it be any old pattern? Could it be, you know, a starfish or something over here? And, um, you know, something with lots of, um, you know, weird, weird um, octopod legs? Um, and the answer is, yeah, it could. It would, it would find that instance of that pattern over, over in D. And it turns out this is a very um, a general and important notion. And in general, we often have what are called these, these index categories, um, which, which are kind of these skeletal beasts like this. And we map from the index category into another category. It's just like finding all instances of the pattern over there. So if we enumerate all the functors, um, then we, we've sort of identified all instances of this structure over here in D, much as we did over here in set with our, oh, 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 oh with our, um, you know, with, with our mapping like this. So here, you know, Brendan was kind of had his hands tied behind his back because he didn't want to introduce functors. But um, this is, uh, oops, not that one, the, the other one, um, the ugly one, right? Uh, uh, this is kind of, you start to see its power and it, and it gets really cool because you can, you can take this at many levels. And later we'll see, like you can do this with dynamical systems. And, and find uh, these patterns. So this notion of pattern finding and of shapes like this maps from them as kind of probes to discover structure, to identify regular structure that corresponds to them, uh, extends throughout category theory in various forms and at sort of different levels. This is kind of the most basic level, which Brendan couldn't really speak about, but sort of waved his hands at. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, Jenna, but um, that's that was kind of the idea that he was to which he was alluding. Yeah, very helpful. I get it now. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, and there's some really cool things. Like there's some things where like this is a commuting square. You don't you don't know about commuting squares yet, but um, you you may have some sort of uh, inchoate memory or primordial memory of them. But this, if this is a primordial square, you can. Primordial square here. <laughs> it's a commuting square. You can find commuting squares over here. And it's really cool. It's 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 really, really interesting stuff and very deep. Okay. Um unfortunately that that kind of maxes out uh the hour. I actually had lots of little slides I'd love to show you, but uh the more important thing is to answer your questions. And I hope this was helpful. I will have office hours for this class on Monday afternoon as normal. 
and I'm happy to answer questions, you know, related to uh, to this material more generally there. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to slip in some of the learning I was going to show today, um, you know, in another in another session. But uh, yeah, this this is a notion of shapes as objects. And last time we saw some of these notions of, uh, you know, pre-order and uh, these pre-orders. Um, I didn't note that like uh, really um, uh, with a pre-order category, there should be an indication and in the so-called presentation. These are called presentations of a category, abstractions, and you should really indicate when two things are equal, like if paths are equal from B to D, you should indicate that with a annotation here. Um, there's a comment in, in their seven sketches book to that effect. You know, if these are all the same paths, because this is a pre-order, everything, there's only one link from B to D, from B to whatever this thing is, um, from, sorry, from this guy to this guy, then you would actually write this down that those equal. Whereas in a free category, any of these paths are different. They're, they're different things, they're not equal. In a pre-order, we collapse a lot of that. It's all the, going from B to D is just one thing, no matter whether you go this way, or you go this way, or you go this way, it's all the same. Um, so that was something about pre-orders. And then monoids, well, we have delightful, we have monoid delight coming up, so I'm not awfully worried about that. Um, Okay, um, generalized elements. Yeah, um, good. Okay, I'm I'm keeping uh, poor Rafat wa uh, uh, waiting here, but uh, hopefully that's useful. Oh, Shayan, you had a, a question. Is that right? Oh, sorry. No, so maybe I have missed something. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, good. Um, would it find compositions? Jenna asks. Oh, yes. Would the walking arrow find compositions? Uh, yeah, so so you you probably don't remember it, but a, um, uh, a part of the properties of a functor, which is really nice, is it? Well, it preserves structure. It maps categories in a way that preserves structure. And one of the things that it does not only does it map identities to identities, it actually maps um, compositions to compositions. Ah, so if you have I'm tempted to pull up the diagram again. If you have, you know, uh, an A to B and you have a B to C, and then you map each for the functor. So A goes to F of A, B goes to F of B, C goes to F of C. Um, then the if you compose those two morphisms, you know, A to B, call it F, B to C, call it G, uh, and you get a, a, a morphism out from that composition over in C, if you map that, it has to map to the composition of f of f, like the, the translation of f to the other category, but f of g, and, and those have to compose in d to, that compo to the mapping of the composite. So that's exactly right. Like, yeah, it, it, the, 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 um, the walking arrow idea carries over. So if you had two arrows end to end, you could find these kind of composites. Um, well, mumble. It, 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 you could do it, and so it'll, it'll. It's guaranteed to find composites and so on, which is cool. Um, at least, at least for me. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that's um, that's a little bit about walking arrows, and it, it's really about finding patterns. And you can find patterns for all sorts of things. And category theory is in some ways about patterns because patterns are about relationships and, and we find these relationships in other, other structures um, or we find these structures as depicted by patterns in other categories, for example. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope that's useful. For next time, we will uh, be looking at uh, two things. Yes, um, I should. Screencast. Um, um, here, here we go. Uh, mumble. Um, wait. Okay. Uh, there we go. So um, the single most important thing is this guy. Um, but particularly if you want to learn um, 
more about pre-orders and monoids, Bartosz Mieluski has some really nice sort of material on that that further expands in some of these ideas. And it's it's at this link, but and, and this link goes directly to um, time 2944. And if you watch onwards from there, you'll kind of get the, the gist of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd recommend that, but this is the most important thing. And I think we'll directly see next time um, we'll be able to talk more in a more fulsome way about about functors, okay? Um, so uh, functor, uh, uh, functors between categories and how they're, they're structure preserving mappings and so on. Um, uh, yep, uh, functors is structure preserving mapping between categories and we'll see how they relate to Haskell structures uh, in the form of, of functors with things like, uh, in which we can do fmap, we can lift functions conceptually from one category to another. In this case, it'll be from Hask to Hask. Okay, that's all I best get to refine. Thank you so much. Take care there.